Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today's message is entitled The Forgiveness Formula, and it's based on Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. The Life Notes are available now to download from our website, calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here's Pastor Robert Smith. You can go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be with you today. My name is Robert, one of the pastors here, and I invite you to take your Bibles or Bible apps, open them to Luke chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, you can grab one of the Bibles in the seats in front of you. It's on page 1027. If you're tuning in from Parker today, grateful to have you. There are some uh, tables in the back with Bibles. You're welcome to stand up at this time, make your way back to the back of the room and grab some of those. Um, And uh, hey, we're excited to have you here. And um, I am excited for today, but also excited for next week. I hope that you are planning to come back because next week we launch a new series called Limitless which is looking at the book of Nehemiah and the way that God wants to rebuild our lives. And uh, no matter where we're at, I think there's some things that we are all uh, desiring for God to build or rebuild. And so we're gonna spend five weeks looking at how he can do that. And each week's got some, some real practical steps for us, some homework for us to be working on throughout those, those weeks, uh, but also each individual week. And so I hope that you come back and, and really plug into Limitless, but I also hope that you plug into a group through that time so that you've got people to have conversation with and to process that with and to share what God's doing along the way in that, uh, because I think he's going to do some really amazing things. And along the way, we'll be talking about what the big things we're praying for God to do in the life of our church and uh, the future here as well. Uh, And Pastor Chad will be sharing more about that starting next week. So I hope that you're looking forward to that. Hope that you're already signed up in in a life group. And uh, if not, uh, this is your chance. So don't leave here without uh, investigating that and getting plugged in. But you know, we are diving into Luke chapter seven today. And uh, it's interesting as you look through scripture, you see some themes that, that pop out. And one of those is that often some of the, the more pivotal moments happen around a mealtime, which really shouldn't surprise us all that much because the same is true of our life, isn't it? We, we have some of those great conversations, those life-giving moments with friends and family after we eat a meal and we're sitting around the table. We also have some of those really tense and awkward moments uh, around the table with, uh, especially we're just coming out of the holiday season. Maybe you had some of those with some awkward conversations or tense moments you were hoping to avoid, but you got stuck and then you're there in the midst of a meal and you can't really escape. You can't just like leave in the middle of it without making a scene. And that's a little bit of what happens here in Luke chapter seven. There's an incredibly interesting dinner scene that unfolds for us. And yet another one of these moments where there's incredibly important teaching and truth delivered from Jesus in the context of a dinner meal. And and as we unpack this, I think it's great to pair with where we were last week talking about the mission of Jesus, that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And and this week kind of puts some meat on the bones of what's that look like? What does it look like to follow and serve Jesus? What are some things we need to understand about how we do that? And maybe if we've been doing it for a while, some places that that maybe we need to be aware of that we may uh, get off a little bit if we're not careful. So Luke chapter seven, let's take a look at this and, uh, and see what we can learn from it here today. Starting in verse 36, it says this, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner." Now, there's a lot more. We're going to pause there, though, because there's a lot that I think it's really easy to just kind of breeze by in this. So let's, let's pause and think about the setting here a little bit. Because you've got a Pharisee who has invited Jesus to his house. And if you've been around church for a while, you know that, like, the Pharisees weren't Jesus' big fans. Like, they didn't have the jersey, you know, Jesus' number one fan. They weren't excited about Jesus because Jesus challenged all their religious nonsense. 
They, he challenged the ways that they added bloat to what it meant to follow God and their, their legalism and judgmental mindsets. He spoke against all of what that was. So with, with the Pharisee inviting Jesus over for a meal, this wasn't, hey, we're buds, you're in my town, let's hang out and grab a meal. The Pharisee had some ulterior motives here probably. He's, he's probably trying to observe Jesus so he can trap him in something, so he's got some evidence to hold against him, a statement he made or an action he took. That's what the Pharisee's got going on here. But all of his plans get disrupted when someone crashes the party. And, and so this woman, we're told, comes uninvited to the party. Now, we're not actually told she's not invited, but we don't really need to be, do we? Um, it's very clear that she didn't have an invitation to this dinner party, both in social stature or just in the, 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 the tangible nature of the invitation list. And we're told that she's a woman of the city, which is probably the polite shorthand way of scripture of saying that she's a prostitute or at least someone of that character type. And she comes and disrupts everything. She comes and, and, and becomes the center of the attention, essentially. And, and I think it's, it's interesting here because we can read these words on the page and they're, you know, this nice black and white font, but I think there's so much that we might miss in just the drama and dynamic nature of this setting. And so I want you to just imagine with me for a second that you're at a dinner party and there's religious people there, and, and Jesus is there, and all of a sudden, a woman of ill repute comes in and starts crying at the feet of Jesus. Now, that alone is pretty disruptive, but it's not just like she's crying and sad and broken. She's weeping so much that Jesus' feet are saturated with her tears. They're, they're so saturated, in fact, it says she's drying his feet with her hair. There's, there's, there's this puddle of tears at the feet of Jesus because of her crying. Now, there's not probably a dinner, like, etiquette protocol to navigate you through a situation like this. It, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sitting there like, okay, they've, they've got to be talking before this happens. So do they like pause in between her weeping? Do they talk until it gets to the point that her weeping's too loud? They can't? Or do they just all stop and go, I, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> like, what, it, what, what are we going to do? Do we like kick her out? Jesus, are you going to say something? And in the midst of this, the Pharisee, this host, makes a comment to himself, at least he thinks it's to himself, and now all the world gets to know his comment because Jesus knew exactly what he was thinking. He makes this judgmental comment that's aimed both towards Jesus and towards the woman. If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And that launches us into the lesson of the evening. Let's pick up verse 40. And Jesus answering, there wasn't anything that he thought needed to be answered, but Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, say it, teacher. He continued in verse 41, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So Jesus launches this lesson here by telling a parable, and it's a pretty simple parable. A parable of these two people who both owed money. One was 500 denarii, the other 50. And, and for simple conversion, we could say that that roughly equates to about $100,000 and $10,000 by today's standards. And so these are both considerable amounts of money. If any of us were forgiven $10,000 of debt, we would be pretty excited. If any of us were forgiven $100,000 of debt, we would be even more excited. 
And, and Jesus uses this and launches the question, which of these is going to be more grateful? Which one of these is going to love the one who forgave more? And did you notice Simon's reluctance to answer? I suppose, he said, the one for whom the larger debt was forgiven. Because I think he understood the implication. But just in case, Jesus said, hey, do you see this woman over here? And he, what he does is he puts them both in the story. He's like, just in case you're not getting it, let's, let's put both of you in this story. And let's do a little comparison and contrast. But he doesn't compare their past. He doesn't compare the amount of their debt. But instead, he compares their response to this hypothetical forgiveness. And he says, hey, Simon, I, I entered your house and, and you didn't wash my feet. In fact, he says, you didn't even give me water to wash my feet myself. And this is the most basic of first century hospitality in a, a world that is full of dirt roads and sandals for shoes and poor hygiene. You didn't want to hang out in someone's house without washing your feet. And Simon gives him no opportunity to do so. And yet this woman she comes in and begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears. A little unconventional, we could agree, but an extravagant show of love and compassion and care. He says, you didn't do that. He, he continues, he says, you didn't kiss me when, when I arrived. And all of us Westerners we are like, thank you for not kissing me. <laughs> but see, for them, that was their warm greeting instead of a handshake or a fist bump, a, a, a hug and a kiss on the cheek was the accepted warm greeting of someone that you cared about. But Simon didn't do that. But he says, this woman from the time she entered has not ceased to kiss my feet. She's continued to do that. Again, a little unsanitary, but one, uh, an act of incredible love and compassion and care for Jesus. And he continues with the third one and he says, and he's like, you didn't even anoint my head with oil. As a Pharisee, a religious leader, this act of blessing and, and, and hospitality for a guest again goes 0 for 3 with Simon the Pharisee, but this woman came prepared to do that on Jesus' feet. And he wraps it up by saying, hey, this woman's sins are indeed many, but she's forgiven because she loves much. Now, it's important to know that she isn't forgiven because she did these things. And we'll come back to that in a little bit, but he, he, he makes this incredibly clear at the end. He says, hey, your faith has saved you, go in peace. It's not the fact that she did these things that allowed her to be forgiven and saved. Instead, what he's helping us to see is that this is the proper result of her understanding of forgiveness. This is her response to the fact that she's been forgiven. And this is the, the lesson that he's wanting us to learn here as we look at this. And for us to learn, we also need to look at the questions that he asked Simon. Now there's some kind of silent questions along the way, but these are questions that we're gonna look at and this is gonna help us place ourselves in this story and go, okay, where do we need to find ourselves here? Who do we maybe uh, align ourselves with? Who do we relate to the most? What part of the story needs to challenge and convict us and where we're at with our walk with Jesus? And the first question is, have you been forgiven much? Because see, he compares these two people who from the outside seem to have very different amounts of forgiveness need. And I think that's why he told the parable that way because I think the, they have a difference in both how they view their need for forgiveness but also how they pursue it. Because while Simon doesn't really respond to this, this parable and this story, I think if he did, he would say, well, I'm kind of the guy with the 50. Like if I need forgiveness and I probably don't because I'm a pretty good guy and I'm a religious leader and I got all these good things going on, if I need forgiveness, I maybe need the 50 amount. But the woman comes full well knowing that she's like the 500 need for forgiveness, maybe even multiple of those. And you see in how she interacts in her extravagance and her submission and humility and bowing before Jesus that she understands that she needs that grace and forgiveness. And here's the thing. It is so easy for us as people, especially people who are, are, are in a church setting like this and pursuing God to say, well, I'm doing pretty well. Right? We're, we're, we've got respectable jobs and good social standing. Maybe we could look at our life and go, man, we don't have any addictions or destructive habits. I go to church, you know, when I can. 
I don't lie that much. I don't hurt people physically. And we, we start to look at the outside of our life and the outside appearances and judge our self and our righteousness off of that. But in doing so, we miss some of the significant things along the way that we need forgiveness of. We miss the fact that maybe the inside of our life is full of pride and judgmental thoughts like the Pharisee. Pride that makes us think we don't need God and his forgiveness. Maybe the inside is full of anger and hatred that we're just trying to keep contained and on the inside so people don't actually see the rage that is built up in us. Maybe it's full of lust or porn addiction that we're just trying to conceal so no one knows the dirty thoughts that are actually on the inside. Maybe it's full of other things we don't think are as bad like selfishness and unforgiveness and idolatry. And maybe we're missing the fact that our life is actually full of things on the inside that we're in desperate need for forgiveness of because we've defined forgiveness by what the outside of our life looks like, not by what our heart is. And maybe along the way we've missed the fact that that we've commit these sins against the holy and perfect God of the universe and that that's where our offense lies. See, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how even in little petty things, we understand that who we offend matters. Uh, as, as a parent of two little kids, I get the fun job, and I say fun with like the sarcasm quote around it, the fun job of helping my kids understand the consequences of their choices. Uh, and everyone who's a parent in here is smiling because you're like, yeah, there's that. I think that's like the main job of parenting. It's a job, but there's that. So one of the things that, that my kids get in trouble for the most is their words, the words that they say and how they say them. And, and I was thinking about this and how they do that and who the recipient of that is determines the consequences. And this is very small in comparison to what we're talking about here. But as a comparison, if they're being rude and hurtful towards their other friends and peers, we're gonna pause and have a conversation and redirect and say, no, we're not gonna do that. If they're rude and hurtful and mean towards each other, it gets more severe. There's bigger consequences. We're slowing things down a bit more. But I think they tell you this, if, if I overhear them being rude and mean towards my wife, their mom, then things slow down a lot. And, and they're made to understand that under no circumstances do they talk to my wife and their mother like that. And there's bigger consequences because who we offend matters. And our sin is the same way. Who we offend matters. No matter if we think that that our sin is justifiable and it's not that big a deal and it doesn't hurt anyone but us, our sin and rebellion is against the holy and perfect God of the universe. We have offended the person who is the, the worst to offend in terms of the consequences. And as much as we wanna justify and put on a a smiling face on the outside and say, hey, my life is doing pretty good, on the inside, we're full of brokenness and a need for forgiveness because we've offended the God of the universe. And so what do we do with that? We take on a posture of humility and we ask for forgiveness just like this woman does. And, And the first step of that process is exactly what we've been talking about is understanding that need for forgiveness. God, I am a sinner who has rebelled against you. I need forgiveness. What comes next is outlined in Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice it doesn't talk about anything we do externally. It doesn't say if you go to church, if you go to a membership class, if you get baptized, if you get a name tag and you become official and you're there this many weekends out of the year, none of that. It's about us saying, hey, I am a sinner in need of grace and Jesus loved me so much, he came down, lived a perfect and sinless life. And I believe that he went to the cross to pay for my sins, died, was buried and rose three days later and I'm making a commitment to follow him with my life. And when we do that, we are forgiven because he is the one who forgives. He is the one who takes our sin away. He is the one who gives us a new start. And so the question is, have we been forgiven? And if we've done that, how are we seeing ourselves after that? Because it's so easy to go, hey, I understand all those things. I've had that moment 
where I see my brokenness and my sin, I've come before Jesus, I've gotten forgiveness, and now I'm perfect. And you laugh because you understand that, that following Jesus means continually, every single day, coming before him, asking for forgiveness. Because the, the presence of sin does not leave just because we have bowed before Jesus and said, hey, I want to be your follower. You are my savior. I'm giving my life to you. But we have to make sure that we don't view ourselves like this Pharisee does of I have a place of you know, moral superiority because I am a follower of Jesus. I go to church and I have these things in my life. No, we need to continually take on this posture of humility of bowing before Jesus saying, I continually need your forgiveness and your grace in my life. In fact, I had a, a seminary professor draw a graph in our class one time and this has stuck with me ever since this moment. And he said, if you want to grow in your understanding of how good God is, and he, he starts drawing this like chart up on this board. He's like, the only way to grow in your understanding of how good God is, is to understand how bad you are. And how understand how much you need grace and forgiveness. And the, the other side of that is how much he continues to provide grace and forgiveness in your life. And so the question that, that Simon is asked and the question that we need to ask is, is, have you been forgiven much? Do you understand this need for forgiveness? Have you stepped into the place of accepting it and acknowledging the vast amount of forgiveness that each one of us needs? But the second question that we need to ask is, are you loving much in return? Because Jesus makes it clear that those who are forgiven much love much, but the, the statement he also makes is if you're forgiven little, you'll love little. And that was the, the, the statement that was kind of tossed towards Simon, not as a direct uh, implication, but as that silent accusation that, Simon, you haven't been forgiven much, and so you're not loving much in return. But our life, our expression of how we live out our faith, of how we serve God, of how we represent him to the world around us, needs to be one where we are living with this essentially continual statement where we're saying, God, you have loved and forgiven me so much, I want to give you every part of my life. And my life is going to be a continual outpouring of gratitude and thankfulness for the forgiveness you've poured into my life. And so let me ask you, are you doing that? We've looked at how we need to have an awareness of our need for forgiveness, but what is your response to that? Are you loving much? Are you loving much by actively prioritizing your time with Jesus and saying, you're gonna be my priority of how I spend time in your word, of how I pray, of how I worship, of how I spend my time? Are you loving much by growing in your obedience to his character by saying, I'm gonna to submit to your wisdom and direction from the Bible? Are you loving much by submitting to his plan for your money, your sexuality, your career, your purpose? All these things that culture says identify who we are, are you letting Jesus identify you in those areas? Are you loving much by making him the priority of your life? Are you loving much by forgiving people the way he has forgiven you? All these are, are a start of how we can live out this expression of gratitude and say, hey, I'm loving Jesus much because he's forgiven me. But we can also go the easy way out on this. So are you loving little in these areas? Are you loving little by giving Jesus the leftovers of your time and your energy? Are you loving little by, by only obeying the parts of scripture you like and agree with and ignoring the rest? Are you loving Jesus little by submitting to only your plan for your money and your sexuality and your career and your purpose? Are you loving little by making your agenda and priorities the purpose of your life by not forgiving people the way God has forgiven you? See, as we look at this story in these two individuals, I think it's interesting as well to step back and kind of think about how this day went for each one of them and to draw some comparisons in that because the Pharisee had a plan for this day. This plan included Jesus, but I don't think that Jesus was actually the main part 
of the Pharisees' plan. I think that, that he had an agenda to grow his, his leadership and clout as a Pharisee. I think that he was trying to spend time with Jesus so he could go back to his Pharisee friends and say, hey, I heard Jesus say this, and, and that they would respect him greatly and they could judge him privately. And, and I think that Jesus was like an accessory to the Pharisees' agenda that day. But the woman, on the other hand, we don't know what her schedule and priority was, but we see in the story that as soon as she found out that Jesus is there, she dropped everything. She rearranged her day, she got the ointment, she came over, and she sacrificially served and, and loved Jesus at the expense of her time, at the expense of this ointment that she brought, at the expense of her social dignity for how she conducted herself that day. And Jesus wasn't just something else that was happening that day. Jesus was the agenda and priority of her day. And I wonder if we were to place ourselves in that part of the story, I wonder what challenge we could apply to ourselves there. I wonder if we look at this and we understand that loving much means that we make Jesus more than just an accessory to our days. That loving much means giving him everything of who we are. That loving Jesus much means that he needs to be the central purpose and priority of everything that we do, of how and why we make decisions, of how we treat and care for people, for how we do relationships and how we navigate our morality and how we do everything. And that if we're going to love Jesus much, it means that he's not just an accessory to our life, something we sprinkle on on the weekends or something that when we have some extra time we think about, but it's something that permeates every part of what we do. And it defines who we are in every situation. I think as we look at that side of it, we really begin to understand that loving Jesus much is a lot more than just an activity. It's more than just a schedule. It's about what permeates out of our life. And so today, I, I challenge you to evaluate how much you've been forgiven and to think about the, the, the sins that you've committed and the forgiveness that you've received from Jesus and to process if you have assigned the proper value to that forgiveness and if you're responding with the proper gratitude and thankfulness for it. Because Jesus describes here that those who are forgiven much love much and we see that that love is to be extravagant and, and intensive in every way. And so I pray that as, as you process where you're at with Jesus, first I pray that you have stepped into a place of loving and following him and as your savior. If you haven't, we've got a prayer team down here across the front of the stage after service. They'd love to pray with you, talk with you through that, and maybe even start that moment today as you call Jesus your savior. But if you have done that, I pray that that forgiveness that you've received would define your life in a dramatic way and that you would live as bold recipients of God's grace, both loving Jesus and loving other people boldly because of it. Because as Jesus reminds us, those who are forgiven much love much. So let's be people who both understand the amount of our forgiveness and respond with the proper amount of love towards our Savior. Let's pray. God, we thank you that your love is extravagant and generous towards us as people who are often flippant towards our sin and rebellion, as people who don't often understand the gravity of what we do against you. God, we thank you that, that your love covers the multitude of sins there. We thank you that, that you are compassionate towards us, that you loved us even while we were sinning against you. And God, I pray that you would help us to be people who understand the forgiveness we've received, who continually pursue and ask for that forgiveness from you, and who live lives where you're not just an accessory to it, but that you're the central purpose of what we do and how we do it in every way and that we love others and love you greatly in response to how much you've loved us. God, we thank you for this reminder, this, this challenge to convict and, and question us of where we're at with you. And I pray today that we would leave here as people who have been forgiven 
as people who love much in return. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Robert discussed loving Jesus in response to his forgiveness in your life. I'd like to challenge you to think of what areas of your life you see that you need to change to love much. If today's message spoke to you and you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can visit our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, and to listen to past sermons. Well, that'll do it for today. Join us next week as we start a new series called Limitless. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.